I've said for a long time that I really feel like some of these uh, race and social justice equity programs cross a line. I mean, the city of Seattle and other entities, you know, having meetings strictly for people of one race and not the other. And, you know, where does the line, um, where, where is the line from, hey, we're, we're striving for um, fair treatment and equality of, uh, for all, where does that cross the line to, in order to get there, we're gonna put down or push down people of another race, white people. So um, I was really interested and intrigued to hear that a former Seattle City employee, a white guy named Joshua Demert, he has filed a lawsuit, a uh, federal civil white rights lawsuit against the city of Seattle claiming racial discrimination, a hostile work environment, he claims because of the color of his skin. Uh, his attorneys are offering up several examples that they say prove that he was treated differently. He was discriminated against. Uh, he was subjected to a hostile work environment because he's white. I had a lengthy com conversation with uh, the attorney in this case to talk about the details of the case and what evidence they have to prove his claims. Laura, welcome to Undivided. Introduce yourself to folks. Sure, thank you so much for having me on your show. My name is Laura D'Agostino and I'm an attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation. What does the Pacific Legal Foundation, what kind of cases do you typically handle? So we are a public interest law firm and we focus on very specific areas of constitutional litigation. I'm part of the equality and opportunity group. So generally we're looking at violations that are occurring across the country that would go against the 14th amendment. And my colleagues, some of them are focused on property issues. So defending uh, clients against home equity forfeiture, against eminent domain and other specific property issues that come up. And then I also have colleagues that work on separation of powers, which is just a fancy term for ensuring that Congress doesn't improperly allocate its authority amongst agencies and that everything is going according to the Constitution to ensure a system of checks and balances. You guys, the case we're about to discuss, you're doing it pro bono, why? So just by virtue of being a public interest firm, we want to be in a position to vindicate people's constitutional rights who might not otherwise have the resources to do so. And I think that's one of the most rewarding aspects of my work is just being able to represent some of the most wonderful clients imaginable and help give them a voice when they might not otherwise have the resources to do so. Uh, based on uh, what your law firm does that you just described to us, obviously discrimination cases are going to be a part of that. How often do you guys see cases where it's a white person who's claiming that they're being discriminated against on the basis of race? So we're actually seeing this come up more often now because of the what we view as an ideology that's kind of sweeping our nation in the sense that we see a, a, a focus on everything being about race. And it comes under many different names. Some people refer to it as critical race theory. Some refer to it as equity. There, are, It goes by many different names. But what we're seeing is sort of a group think mentality in the sense that people are no longer being evaluated as individuals, but instead they're being grouped into whatever their racial identity may be. And there are governments, there are groups that intend on classifying them and making judgments about them on the basis of race, which is the most unconstitutional and immoral approach you can take when you approach anyone. This is the very definition of bias. Yeah, and it's very odd. You know, you see our country and how far it's come when it comes to to race and seeing past skin color. And it's like there's this weird kind of turn in the other direction. And I think some of this is well-intentioned, um, but, you know, I think some people are oblivious to what they're doing. And you obviously have initiatives that kind of go too far. So just at the very core, um, it there's no question that discriminating against someone on the basis of race, regardless of what their race is, their skin color is, is against the law. So this case really comes down to the facts of the case and what you're able to prove. So take us through the facts of the case and take as much time as you want. Absolutely. So Joshua Dimer, our client, is a former city of Seattle employee. He worked in their human services department. And this was truly a dream job for him because he has a real heart for service. And he was really excited to apply his technological know-how in a way to be able to make the city's resources more accessible to marginalized communities in Seattle. 
And so what started occurring from day one in the office, despite the fact that Joshua was sought out by members of other departments, he was he even received an award for his work, he started noticing that every aspect of everything he did came down to, a, to the city's racial analysis. Now, in order to form a good context about everything that Joshua went through, you have to understand that the city of Seattle has a program called the Race and Social Justice Initiative. It began in 2005, but it was really formulated in the late 90s. It was sort of in, a, um, in some brainstorming sessions. There were people thinking about this. And what the Race and Social Justice Initiative purports to be is a effort to end structural racism. So all the terms the city uses to describe the program actually sounds like a noble venture to reduce bias and to ensure equality in the workplace. Yeah. However, what it actually translates to and when you actually see the training documents that the city uses as part of this program, it is not only inherently unconstitutional, but it is also just purely discriminatory in every way. And how it's applied is that employees have to fulfill at least two activities each year that either promote the program or it encompasses training that has to do with it. And the city also coerces its employees to participate in these groups called caucuses. And according to your racial identity, that's the caucus you can attend. So they have a white caucus, they have a African American caucus, they have an Asian American caucus, and they explicitly promote racial divisions among their employees. So I wanted to kind of spell out, this is the background of what's going on here. And they even have a racial equity toolkit, which every city policy must apply a racial lens whenever it does anything. And all departments ultimately stream data and information to the mayor who oversees everything and ensures that the departments are doing their job to implement this initiative across the board. This is really at the foundation of everything our client went through, apart from his, the individual discrimination that he went through. So how it started with him, at one point he was serving in a supervisory role and he needed to take some time off in order to deal with a chronic health issue. His supervisor at the time told our client, Mr. Deitmer, that he should resign from his position because according to her, he was being selfish and he was holding back people of color from being able to be a supervisor. And so you can imagine our client was shocked that he actually was approached by a supervisor this way. And when he went and reported it, he felt that he was not only not supported, but that HR and the other management levels were in support of what his supervisor was doing. And so, so just to be clear on that, so he had a medical issue and I'm assuming this is FMLA? Correct, yes. So legally allowed to take it. And the idea being that instead of going on some extended leave, he should resign so someone of color could promote? Exactly, that was what his supervisor told him. And this would have been exactly in line with the Race and Social Justice Initiative because this program focuses on promoting whatever racial groups it has determined should be promoted because it divides everyone based on oppressed or oppressor. And it goes even deeper than that. There are even characteristics that they define of white supremacy. And if you see their internal documents, it's not what you think. It, characteristics of white supremacy include things like um, being on time, having an obsession with perfectionism. Uh, if you are from a European background or you are a Christian background or you are non-disabled, these are all categoristics that put you in this privileged group. And so if you are in that group that the city defines, you are inherently racist, both consciously or, un or unconsciously. And that's the badge you have forever while you're working in that office. There's nothing you can do. There's no goodwill you can show. You will always be classified as being someone that possesses this subconscious racism because you live in a system that privileges you. And so this is what's going on. And so 
Mr. Deitmer was following the law, taking leave that he was entitled to, which by the way, it's also against the law to discriminate against someone for taking this type of medical leave. Right. And he was being told, you're being selfish by trying to hold on to your job because there's a person of color who could be doing your job while you're taking your medical leave. It's one thing for him to say, hey, this happened to me. Do you have proof that that happened to him? When it comes to everything that our client went through, we have extensive documentary evidence of, that backs up not only the training materials, the discriminatory um, messaging of everything. With respect to the FMLA leave, we do not have a, um, a, a documented email that contains that description, but we have evidence of each time that Mr. Deitmer reported it and his summary and to all the supervisors it went to. You have kind of a trail after the fact of him saying, hey, this just happened to me. Exactly. Yes. But the initial um, incident where it says, hey, you should just resign so someone of color can be promoted, that was verbalized to him. It was verbalized to him. Um, you have some other um, kind of supporting um, stories that go along with this narrative and sort of contribute to it. Can you talk about some of the most hostile things that um, Mr. Dimer encountered allegedly during his time with the city of Seattle? Absolutely. So I'll give you a couple of, of the main examples, but there, there are many that occurred during his eight and a half years with the city. One time he found a fellow coworker denying applicants based on race. So in the human services department, there would be people that would apply for access to city services. And his coworker said that she was deliberately denying white applicants because they had privilege. When Mr. Deitmer reported that to his supervisor at the time, he was told that it's impossible for whites to be discriminated against because they, they live in a system of white supremacy. So it's impossible for a white person to ever experience racism and he shouldn't have reprimanded his coworker for, for doing that. What kind of services were these that people were seeking from the city and being allegedly denied for on the basis of race? So there, are, there were a couple. There's the uh, vehicle rebate program, um, I don't recall the specific service that involved in this applicant. I can follow up with Joshua so that I can get that detail. But it would have been, um, th there were programs where uh, applicants could have gotten help with paying certain bills, whether it be their utilities. There was a utility discount program. I believe it would have been the ut utility discount program, but I would have to verify with Joshua. So these are citizens of Seattle coming to the city with some sort of financial need, trying to apply for it. And it's Mr. Dimert's allegation that his colleagues were refusing that, not on the basis of need, but on the basis of skin color. Yes, that was one specific example that he found of a coworker denying people just because of the color of their skin. He also had, um, I, I read, some really personal sort of attacks and interactions with fellow employees because he was white. Can you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. So another major example that we found, there was there within the city of Seattle, they have a, a system called SharePoint where employees can upload articles, they can correspond with one another. And one of the one of Mr. Deitmer's co-workers uploaded an article that talked about the Tulsa massacre, I believe of 1921. And Mr. Deitmer posted his comments about that and how he felt that the coworker was slanting this historical event. Well, after that, there were fellow coworkers that read what Mr. Deitmer had posted, and we have this email thread. And within the email thread, they compare Mr. Deitmer to being a Nazi. They said that he should be, they wish that someone would find him in the bathroom and beat him bloody, and that he was just someone that they don't even, they don't even want to bother responding to because he'll just come back with, quote, more idiocy. So there was immense hostility from there. And Mr. Deitmer often wondered why he was getting all these weird looks around the office, why he was encountering this hostility. That's one example. But the most egregious example that we found is that Mr. Deitmer reported one of his coworkers for trying to fraudulently get benefits for a family member that owned a daycare. So there was some kind of benefit that you, that these daycares could get by applying with the city to get some relief. And Mr. Deitmer found that his supervisor at the time was trying to get him to approve this, this very specific application. But when he went and looked into it, he realized that this was a family member of his supervisor. And so he reported it to ethics. 
And when his supervisor found out about it, he had cousted him not once, but twice. And the second time he got in his face, chest bumped him and said that Mr. Deitmer had only reported him because he's a white supremacist, he's a racist, and that it's not his fault if he had tried to commit fraud because he lives in a system of white supremacy. Mr. Deitmer, again, reported all of these incidents and the only solution the city had was to just move him one cubicle over and he was forced to continue reporting to that same supervisor for the remainder of his employment with the city. Wow, a couple things there. You mentioned this email thread, you know, basically comparing him to Nazis, saying he should be beaten bloody. You're saying that you have those emails. We do. And do those employees who engaged in that kind of language still have jobs with the city of Seattle? My understanding is that they're still both employed with the city of Seattle, but I would need to verify to see if they're still with the city. And have you released their names publicly? No, we have not yet released their names publicly. Well, I wouldn't release them publicly per se, but I would like to get those names from you so I could check on their employment status with the city. I I will I will send that to you offline since there's there's some things we're we're doing as well. Yeah. And I I certainly don't want them to be targeted while all this is being sorted out. But I think that's a worthy question is what the city did about that Mm -hmm. Um, in regards to the incident with the chest bumping, et cetera. um, Is his supervisor? What's the race of his supervisor? His supervisor that engaged in this conduct was African-American. And is there witnesses to that? Yes. Our understanding is that there were one or two witnesses that saw what happened. So obviously this isn't a criminal uh, case. So the standards um, by which it proceeds are a little bit different. You know, it's not reasonable be, or guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, first, where does the case stand? Where do things stand? So we went ahead and filed our complaint with, with the federal court. Now we're in the process of serving the complaint on the government. And then at that point, the government will have an opportunity to respond and we'll see what the natural course is at that time. We'll see what information we want to do. It depends what motions they file. So we're still in the very beginning aspects of it because we just filed a few days ago. Um, And has he previously tried to file a claim with the city of Seattle or, or is this the first legal action of any kind he's taken? So Mr. apart from Mr. Deitmer repeatedly reporting all of these incidents of discrimination and hostility that he encountered, he also filed a charge with the EEOC. And then when we got involved, we helped him file a second charge with the EEOC. So before you can bring a Title VII action, you have to first go through the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission. And so he went ahead and filed those charges with the commission and went through that process as well. Okay, and is, are those pending or was there a resolution to those? So for the first charge, they we, we received a decision back and uh, the finding was that there was no discrimination. So we requested our, our, abil- our right to sue letter, it's called. So that way we can file in court. And for the second charge, they were not able to finish the investigation within the allotted timeframe. So we asked for a right to sue letter for the second charge as well. And so that's why we're filing in federal court. I guess based on what you've told me, I I failed to see how it couldn't be an EEOC violation. Can you explain why they said it wasn't, what their rationale was? It's very difficult to know exactly. um, There are so many factors that an EEOC agent can look into. And a lot of their notes of their investigation are redacted. So it's, it's difficult for us to know what arguments they may have found persuasive But what we can say is that we sent them hundreds of documents and they rendered a decision about two or three weeks later. So it's our perspective that perhaps there are things that were overlooked or it's very it's very it would be more conjecture for me to try to to say what influenced the agent, because I I cannot say with with certainty. But we believe that there's overwhelming evidence of of discrimination, of a Title seven violation and no one should have to endure what Mr. Deitmer endured. And so that's why we're proceeding forth with litigation. And was he fired? Did he resign? Um, what was, and if he chose to leave, what was the final kind of straw for him? Sure. So Mr. Deitmer, after the increased hostility and everything he went through, he resigned because he had arrived to a point that it was either his health or his job. And he could not tolerate this environment anymore. And there were a couple of things that were really the final straw. After he filed his EEOC charges, 
He stopped receiving support from his supervisor. She canceled all of their monthly meetings. And uh, she also refused to help him with some technological issues when he was working remotely from home because he was a high risk person for COVID. So, and then on top of that, just the increase in the trainings, the continuing to see emails that were just discriminatory. And as Mr. Deitmer puts it, no reasonable person would have been able to tolerate what was going on. And so he, he made the decision to, to resign and leave. A couple more questions about wh what happens from here. If this ends up in a courtroom, what's the burden of proof here? Is it his word versus the city? I know you have some documentation, not for everything, but for some of the things that happened. So what is the, the burden of proof that you would have to reach to be, you know, to, for your case to be convincing enough? Well, uh, when you're alleging a racially hostile work environment, there are several different factors that you have to prove to the court. So first, you have to show that Mr. Deitmer found the environment to be um, hostile, that the conduct was unwelcome. We have ample evidence of that. We have to show that a reasonable person would objectively find that work environment to be hostile. And based on everything we've heard and everything we've seen, as well as the comments that some of Mr. Deitmer's coworkers informed him of, we believe that that standard is met as well. You also have to show that the city was aware that this harassment was going on and didn't do anything to alleviate it. Again, given Mr. Deitmer's numerous reports, the city was on notice of everything going on and they, there is no base, no way for them to claim that they had no idea. We have internal emails that show that they were talking about Mr. Deitmer. We, we have a lot, of, we have extensive evidence about all of these. So we think that for all of the factors, we have the evidence to, to show that Mr. Deitmer experienced a racially hostile work environment. And to give you just a little bit more detail, it's, it, the court doesn't look at one or two factors individually. They kind of view it as a broad, uh, holistic analysis, if you will. It's not enough to allege a racially hostile work environment if someone said a mean comment to you once. It's not enough if you had maybe one questionable incident happen to you. But in our case, we have eight years of not only Mr. Deitmer experiencing direct discrimination, but the unique aspect is that the very training that the city purports to be anti-biased and to be something non-discriminatory, the city itself was encouraging its employees to discriminate against others. And so that's what's the unique caveat about this. And, and it's our perspective that we meet all of, those, all of those factors. And we also have evidence to show that the city treated Mr. Deitmer differently because of his race. And so we have a constitutional claim as well. So what are you seeking? Money for Mr. Deitmer? Or are you also seeking some sort of structural change to these programs within the city? So we have uh, twofold. We're asking for the monetary damages that are allowed under the law, but we're also asking for a declaration that the city's policies and procedures violated Mr. Deitmer's Title VII and constitutional rights. He, everyone is free. Everyone has a right to be free from racial harassment in their workplace. And everything that we've uncovered shows that the city did the exact opposite of that. Uh, just two more things. There are people who do not believe in the concept of reverse racism. Um, is that, I don't know if it's a, it would go to a jury or something, but is that more difficult to kind of get someone to buy into this idea of reverse racism? Have you found it more difficult? Well, you know, Brandy, here's what I would say. I would even take issue with it being called reverse discrimination. I would just call it discrimination, period. I think anytime someone does not judge you as an individual, but judges you by the color of your skin, that in and of itself is discriminatory and unlawful. And it shouldn't happen to anyone. It, and I think that anyone that would have found themselves in Mr. Deitmer's position, whether they, no matter what their nationality, no matter what their background is, they would have found that conduct to be demeaning and offensive. And there were actually, Mr. Deitmer actually had coworkers uh, both from um, d different different groups that reported to him that they felt that this was demeaning to them and they felt that they were being put in a box just because of the color of their skin. But they went along with it because they said, look, I've got a family to support. I don't want to stick my neck out there. I, I don't want to make enemies. And they saw how Mr. Deitmer had been treated. 
and that just the city's conduct towards him created an additional chilling effect. So that's what I would say, Brandy. I would say discrimination is discrimination. I, I don't think that we should call it reverse discrimination just because one group is at the tail end of it versus another. I think that anytime someone is treated as a member of a group, that demeans them and, and their unique individuality. I think that's a really good point. Let's end with this. There's no question that this country has a um, terrible history when it comes to racism. And as we were saying earlier, I think some of this started as being well-intentioned. Um, you want to make sure, you know, as the government, that people aren't being discriminated against on the basis of race. And given for a long time in our history, those were, were Black people, brown people, uh, and Asian Americans. So where, from a legal perspective, do you believe kind of the line is between a government entity trying to make sure that people who've been historically discriminated against um, don't continue to be, um, and then going too far in sort of trying to achieve that end? Where do you think is a line there? I think the line comes down to this. I think if you want to address the concept of bias, that's something very noble and admirable because you want to create work environments that allow people to focus on their work, to treat one another with respect, and to ensure that no one goes into a work environment where they feel unsafe. But I think that when you start grouping people and deliberately separating them on the basis of race, so saying, okay, if you are a white European, you need to go over there. If you are Hispanic, you need to go over there. When you start dividing people in this way, and then you also give out materials that says, hey, by the way, we put together a document that shows common behavioral patterns for people who identify with your racial identity. I think that that's horrendously egregious and it should not happen in any environment. So I would say where we draw the line is where you stop treating someone as an individual and you start making preconceptions and prejudices about them just because of the pigmentation of their skin. That it is, it is so immoral to dismiss someone, to dismiss the unique soul that a person has just because of the color of their skin. And so I, I, I mean, I would go back to uh, Martin Luther King's quote about judging people by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. So. I think that if you want to talk about bias, that can be done so. And if you want to talk about history, that's perfectly fine. But when you want to talk about how people, how you think people of different racial groups act, I think you're going past the line and you're disrespecting and demeaning people. I have to agree. Laura, this has been so fascinating. I appreciate the level of detail uh, that you brought to the conversation. We look forward to seeing uh, where this case ends up. Thank you, Brandy, and I appreciate having this conversation with you. It's really a pleasure to be on your show.